Take yeah. care, Bob. All right. God bless. Take care. Hey. Yeah, of course. Um, so we're trying to work out really the, the idea of the Holy Trinity. Right. And what exactly are the, the, the distinct aspects of it and what do they each bring, if that makes sense. Okay. Are you Christian? Yeah. Okay. I am, my friend. And I take it you've come here <laughs> and have you been challenged on the Trinity at all? No, I, I think I was trying to, we were having a discussion, my friend's Muslim. Okay. Uh, we were having a discussion, I don't think I'm very good at, I couldn't sure. quite distinguish the three things yeah. and to explain it to her very well. I will do sense. my best <laughs> to explain it as best as I can. So basically, um, what we believe is that when we talk about what God is, we say God is one because he's one in his essence. When we talk about who God is, we say God is three because he is who in his per he's three in his person, his Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, n lots of people, initially, they don't get that idea. It's like, how can three be one and one be three? But actually, there is, you know, we, we, I can demonstrate to you that, that three can be one in one way and one in another way, and you'll see it straight away the moment I point it out to you. So, in your mind's eye, imagine an underground water reservoir right in a mountain up a mountain it's a huge huge amount of water inside this mountain and then on one side of the mountain it breaks out and forms a river going down one way and on the other side of the mountain it breaks out and goes down the river the other way you can identify the river river one you can identify the source of the river and you can identify river two in what in who like in in one way they're three one two three in another way they're one because it's one water from one source right. yeah so this is this is this is in very summary form our understanding of the trinity another example is three-dimensional space you've got the x-axis the y-axis and the z-axis you're standing in three-dimensional space you experience three-dimensional space but you can distinguish between each of these axes and if you rotate these axes so that the x-axis now looks like the y-axis it's still an X, Y, X, Y, Z axis. They're performing the same properties, but they're still distinguishable. Right. So, is, are the two other um, aspects, so the Holy Spirit and Jesus, are they understood to be attributes of one God, or are they three distinct? Yeah. Uh, three distinct, three distinct types of God. Right. So, or are two of them attributes of one God? Firstly, thank you for your question. Yeah, um, what we would say is that each one of the persons, so firstly, they're not attributes, so... They're not attributes. Not attributes, so you can chuck that away, right? Then so they're, they're not features of God. They're not features of God, no. Right. So each of the persons is fully possesses, fully possesses what it is to be God, in the same way that you, you and me all fully possess what it is to be human. Right. Right? And, and our possession of what it is to be human does not take away from our distinctive humanness, but nor does it mean that one of us or two of us or all three of us aren't human, right? So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have distinctives that mean that the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Father. But they still fully possess that thing that is God. Now, the difference between my analogy of us three and God is that we are not in a unique species, we're not in a unique genus, right? God is in a unique species of which the exemplar of God is one. There is not another God, right? Whereas there are lots of different ways of being human. You know, like, and there's, there's, I mean, there's clearly distinctives in, in the sense of uh, our humanity. And I mean, you can argue from an evolutionary point of view that there are other types of humans. So like our species, there are, there are, there are more than one exemplar of, but in the species of divinity, there is only one. The father possesses that fully and completely. The son possesses that fully and completely. And the Holy Spirit possesses that fully and completely. So my analogy does break down a bit. It's not, a, it's not a perfect analogy because God is unique. Right, so, okay, so this is the understanding. Uh, but that's what I think what I was trying to understand. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if you understand it like this as well, but that, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That the Christian understanding of God is that it, that it is unique to anything else, and in that uniqueness there are three different forms of God. Would, it, would, it be, would, it, would that so, be... Uh, the, the, I will stick like some neurotic, obsessive, compulsive bloke to the word person. 
And the, the reason why I do that is not because I'm trying to be awkward, because I'm really not. I, I know you're genuinely engaging and you're trying, trying to get it. But the church in the fourth century gave us a way to describe the Trinity, to guide us away from error and misunderstanding. Right. And it counsels us that when we speak of the hypostasis, when we speak of the person, we say person, we say hypostasis. And that is to protect us from falling into an error of saying that somehow one being is pretending to be another being by changing a mask. Because we're not saying that. We're not saying that like the Father becomes the Son and then becomes the Holy Spirit. We're saying that the Father is a distinct person from the Son and a distinct person from the Holy Spirit. But these three persons fully and completely possess the singularity and the singular uniqueness of divinity. And there is only one divinity that they can possess. So they possess it completely at the same time. Right, so there is not one that is kind of uh, more powerful than the others. They are, they are three equal, yes. powerful persons. Yes, right. Um, and there is not one of them that submits their will to the other one. Or and and, and, and you, 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 the thing is, so the, the, I, I feel I might know what you sort of pointing towards because in the New Testament there's lots of statements where Jesus says I pray to the Father yeah. I do the Father's will yeah. um, and, and, he, and he speaks like this a lot but the thing is in the book of Philippians chapter 2 reading from about verse 15 I think it's 15 it says that Christ in fact I'll show you the verse if you want Christ being in the form of God did not grasp at equality with God but humbled himself and took on the form of a servant. And I think that trips people up because when Christians say that there's not a, a, an inequality, that there's not one submits to the other, you read the New Testament and you go, hold on a minute, Jesus is doing exactly that. But the reason why Jesus is doing that is because he has taken the form of a servant in his earthly life. And so in his earthly life as a perfect human being, he's not gonna be an atheist, because let's be honest, they don't represent the best of humanity. Like, it, it, he takes on the form of a servant, and that means that he relates to his father like a human being. Uh, in, in, in the physical form? In the physical person. form, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, not in the physical form, because the physical form of the person we know is Jesus. Yeah, the physical, right. So, the incarnation, let, let me give you a, a love picture and, and, and uh, metaphors, because I think I know, I know a lot of people think visually. So I want to give you a picture metaphor that kind of describes the incarnation. But like with all metaphors, it's not perfect. Imagine in your mind, you, I give you a gold coin, right? The gold coin obviously has two faces. The image on one face is different from the image on the other face, so they look different. When you look at one face, it looks different to the other face. But the gold that presents the first face and the second face to you runs all the way through the coin. The personhood of Christ is represented by the gold. The human nature of Christ is represented by one face. The divinity of Christ is represented by another face. So, why does this analogy apply to Christ? So, Christ sleeps, Christ eats, Christ goes to the toilet, Christ dies. How does God sleep? He doesn't get tired. How does God eat? He doesn't get hungry. How does God die? He's immortal, right? If I take that gold coin that you've imagined in your mind and I get a sharp implement and I scratch the heck out of one face of the coin, that face is utterly deformed and the gold is affected by the deformity. But the other face remains totally untarnished, totally perfect. What happens to Christ's humanity is like me scratching one side of a coin. It does affect the person of Christ, but his divinity totally untouched. Yes, is the one that goes to the toilet, is the one that falls asleep, is the one that dies on the cross. But the divinity never gets tired, never gets hungry, and never dies. So, is, is there a You follow person? that analogy? Mm -hmm. It's a good one, eh? It's a good one, eh? It's a good one. So, is, is the, is the... I worked on that. <laughs> is the person uh, of Christ... Before, before the, uh, Jesus Christ came into the physical form of the person, what was that part? Of the, what is that part of the divinity referred to? Can I just say, I really love your questions. Because they, they sound sincere and they're honest. No, they really, no, 
no, yeah, no, I, I know, no, no, I mean it, I mean it. Yeah. Like, this is lovely. This is exactly why I come to the park to talk to people like you. I don't often get it, so whenever I do, I sort of relish the joy of it, <laughs> right? So the, the, the reality is that, that when, before Christ takes to himself a human nature, his, he, he exists eternally as a divine person. Okay. Without a beginning. A name yeah, we call, it, we call it the Logos. The Logos. Or, okay. or we call it the Angel of the Lord. Um, has that been the New Testament or the Old Testament? So these, is, these are Old Testament references. We call it the wisdom of God. These are names for Christ before his incarnation. He's only called Jesus Christ at his incarnation. And the angel Gabriel says, you will call him Jesus because he will save his people. And Gabriel is dressing. And an, the, 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 Gabriel is an angel. It is dressing. He is addressing Mary. Mary. Right? So the divine Logos, the wisdom of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, who eternally exists, is God. Right, takes to himself a humanity, and that humanity, that divine God-man, is called Jesus Christ. We now know him as Jesus Christ. Right. And so we do apply the title Jesus to the divine Logos before, just because, you know, logically we're seeing it as a continuum of the same person. Right. But technically speaking, he was known by other names before the incarnation. Physical incarnation. Yeah. Yeah. So does that make sense? Yeah, that, that makes more sense. Yeah, I was never going to get there. Right. <laughs> Sorry, I, that, I mean, the thing, thing is, the like, thing I really wanted to understand like, this kind of yeah. concept from. I guess, yeah. The thing is, as, as, as Christians, we we are utterly committed to monotheism, so we're counselled as Christians that we must never, ever say that we must never say something that implies, suggests, or states that God is not one, and those that do err, and those that remain stubborn in their erring called heretics and they anathematized out of the faith but at the same time we can't say anything that that denies the de the plurality of the persons so we can't confuse the persons we can't say the father is the son or the son is the father and if we do that again that's erring and if we're stubborn in our erring we're then anathematized so by default if someone says I believe in three gods they're not a Christian by default, if someone says, I believe that the Son became the Father, they're not Christian. Yeah? Right. Now, now um, what, what's your name, sorry? Ponida. Sorry? Ponida. Ponida. My name is Bob. Nice and yours? You. Tia. Tia. Great. Uh, is this your first time in the park? Yeah, it's the first time. Right. Hopefully, I mean, you're having a wonderful time. Very I will There's warn... There's been lots of men talking. I haven't seen any women talking. Well, the thing is, the thing is, the thing about the park is that a lot of the men here get aggressive. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. There are fights that happen nearly every week. Okay. There's a lot of intimidation. And I, I absolutely promise you, if some of the Muslim men knew that you were a Muslim talking to me, they would interrupt this conversation. It's only because they're not seeing and not recognizing that you're a Muslim, okay. that we're not being interrupted. Has that happened before? Oh, loads of times. And we have it on camera, on Soko films. Okay. Right? So now let me, may I politely ask you a, a question as a Muslim? Right? So as a Muslim, you obviously... I don't know what, what your personal beliefs are, but Islam states that the Quran is a perfect book without any errors, without any contradictions. It's a perfect book. Everything it states is true, right? Now, when I read the Quran and how the Quran describes what I believe as a Christian, I spot that the Quran is stating things that are actually wrong. And I'll give you an example, okay? So the Quran says, Say not three for Allah is one God. So that implies that we Christians believe in three gods when we don't. It says they do err who say that Allah has become Christ, which is wrong because we don't say that the Father becomes the Son. And it says that do you did you know when Allah is speaking to Jesus, he says, Did I tell you to tell the people to take me and my mother as gods? His mother being Mary. And no Christian takes Mary as a God. They worship her, but they don't take her as a god. And the Quran right. clearly states, did I tell you to take me and my mother as a god beside Allah? Yeah. And the Catholics don't do that. Is that referring to like worshipping someone as if they are god? Well, it's saying, it's saying that Allah is saying to Jesus, did I tell you to tell the people to take you, Jesus, and your mother, Mary, as gods beside Allah? And obviously Jesus says, no, no, I would never do that, right? Obviously, this is not. This is the message version of the Quran. It's like my 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 restatement of it. 
But the reality is, if, if we can identify that the Quran is objectively saying something that's wrong about what Christians believe, bearing in mind that Christians had well published what they believe about the Trinity for centuries before Islam started, right? Like you, yeah, the Council of Nicaea in 325, the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD. Islam arrives in the 7th century, so that's 300 years later, right? To me, this should draw out a question to an honest person that if, if the Quran's got such a blundering error in it, how can it be from God? And I just wondered what your thoughts are on that. Well, I, I haven't read it. I do speak Arabic. Yeah. Um, I can read it a little bit, but I yeah. haven't read what you just said. Would you like me to show you? Um, okay. Yeah. No, no, no. I don't, if you want me to, I don't want um, to impose anything on you. I think, I think my question's been, my question's been answered about the Trinity. Sure. Um, Fair enough. Is there any question that you wanted to ask here that um, we were talking about earlier? I wanted to uh, uh, ask. So you said that in the Old Testament that Jesus, the, the wisdom of God, it's called the wisdom of God. It's called the wisdom of God. It's called the angel of the Lord. Angel just means messenger. Yeah, no, no. I think I've answered my question in my head already then. Right. So, <laughs> I was just like, where was, where was he in the Old Testament? And I was like, oh, there. I remember yeah, 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 yeah. Says they yeah. Were there. Uh, Moses, uh, yeah. Jacob, yeah. you know, all the prophets. Do you have any other questions you'd like to ask? Because this is, I'm really I'm enjoying this and I don't questions. really that get... Was, that was the one I think... Are there any other questions that you struggled with that you want to chuck my way? Really If it comes back, we'll find you. <laughs> right, so I can... Can you speak to Jewish people yeah. about the concept of divinity? Yes. And what are their thoughts on it? So, obviously, no, Jews... I'm asking you to yeah. on what Jews so, so, I'll tell you exactly what Jews tell me. They don't believe in the Trinity, and they don't believe that the Old Testament shows the Trinity. The problem is, right, Jews of today are interpreting the Torah through a 5th century document called the Talmud, right? But the New Testament is a Jewish document written in the first century. It was written by Jews, it was written for Jews. The New Testament? Yes, it's a Jewish document. It was written by Jews, for Jews. Do the Jewish people believe that? No, but the first Jews that were Christians do. And this is the thing, lots of people don't realize that, but when they realize it, a light bulb goes on in your head. Because if the New Testament is a Jewish document written by Jews... Paul Jewish? Yes, Paul was Jewish. Written by Jews for Jews, then that means that our concept of the Trinity is a first century Jewish concept. Right. And, and what happened is that because Christianity came to dominate, because the thing is about Christianity is it, if you'll allow me to take a back step, right, is that the Old Testament refers to an old covenant that was made just with the people of Israel. Right? Yeah. So anyone who was not a Jew was excluded. But the New Testament are the documents of a new covenant. And in that new covenant, the promises of Israel are then offered to everyone who's not Jewish. Right? And that means that obviously certain peculiar things that are specifically about being Jewish are no longer applicable. They're superseded. Right? And, and now suddenly, us Gentiles, because we're three Gentiles here, right? we Gentiles can now sit upon the promises of Abraham, sit upon the promises of David, and, and receive the promises of God that he has given to Israel and now offered to the world, and we can all accept it. He would definitely say I was Jewish. Okay. So Jesus is, is Jewish. Yep. He would see himself as Jewish. So why do Christians not see themselves as Jewish? Right. So the reason why Jesus would say he was Jewish is because he was born into the old covenant. Right? But he introduces a new covenant. Right. Right? So he's like the, the hinge person in history. He literally is the linking point between the old and the new. Him and the, the last person in the the last prophet of the old covenant was John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. The person that links the old covenant that ended with John the Baptist to a new covenant is Jesus Christ. So there are some things that Jesus says and does that are sitting in the old covenant, mm -hmm. and then there are some things that Jesus says and does that are establishing the new covenant because he's that hinge person in history that connects one to the other. And so Jesus would definitely call himself a Jew. 
But the thing is, the first Christians never called themselves Christians. They actually called themselves followers of the way, right? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one goes to the Father but through me. And the first Christians all just said, we're followers of the way, we're followers of the way. Christian was actually given as an insult. It was used by Roman pagans to insult Christians. It literally means little Christ. It's meant to mock Christians. And, and, and Christians took that insult on as a title for themselves in much the same way that Afro-Americans took the N-word on as a way of saying, you threw this out as an insult, but now we're going to own it. Because by taking possession of the insult, you take away its power. And that's what the first Christians did. They took the insult. It's the same with the Enlightenment thinkers. You know, when the Enlightenment emerged in Europe in the 17th century, it was actually mocked, you're the enlightened. It was a way of insulting these philosophers. And then what the philosophers went is, yeah, we are the enlightened. So they took the title on as referring to themselves. Thank you. Any other questions? That's all for me, I think. Brilliant. Any Thank questions you from you? Yeah.